very warm welcome to everyone in our audience as well to uh, today's edition of the Precision Nanosystems uh, Tea Time webinars. Um, so today it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, um, who is uh, Gerrit Borchard of the University of Geneva, and his presentation will be entitled DNA Vaccine Development in a Global Pandemic, a Personal Account. So just before we get started, um, just a couple of um, housekeeping items. So just to introduce um, your European team. So I'm Richard, field application scientist um, based in Oxford, uh, covering the north of Europe, which is Benelux, UK, Ireland and Scandinavia. I work alongside on the commercial side, our commercial leader uh, for EMEA with uh, AJ Johnny and uh, my colleagues um, based in Germany, covering Central and Southern Europe, um, are Martin Rabel, who is um, my equivalent as a field application scientist and the commercial side is uh, handled by my colleague uh, Jürgen schmidt -Sirktig. Um So it's now my pleasure um, to, uh, to hand over to our speaker today, Gerrit Borchardt. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, good morning, good night, wherever you may be. I'm Gerrit Borchardt. I'm a trained pharmacist. I've been working uh, with uh, nanoparticulate formulations, liposomal formulations, ever since my uh, thesis in the University of Frankfurt. Now, we are in different times today, uh, very specific times. And these specific times not only have negative um, repercussions, but there are also some positive things that came out of this pandemic situation, as for instance, the seminar today, which we can attend from the comfort of our homes. I'm actually working from home today. Actually, I'm on vacation, but for this, I interrupt my vacation, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'd like to give you a very personal account of what happened uh, during the lockdown here in, in uh, Geneva in Switzerland and a interaction with the Tuladon Corn Hospital in Bangkok, um, where we developed uh, different formulations for mRNA vaccines, but also DNA vaccines against uh, SARS-CoV-2, but I'll be only talking today about the DNA vaccine development. Um, so I'll give you, let me give you my second slide. I'd like to have a disclaimer here that I do not have any contextual links to PNI. We bought their equipment, but that's about it. And we are, of course, in contact with their technical support. But otherwise, I'm not reimbursed for the seminar. I don't get any uh, reimbursement for this. So all the opinions I'm uh, presenting here today on the technology um, offered by uh, Precision Nano Systems are my own, and they are based on the personal experience of both myself and my people. So when Martin approached me and uh, invited me to give a tea time seminar, I wasn't sure whether he meant tea time or tea time. So I thought I'd uh, do the same thing, and I put up this image there. Now, let's get right into it. Um, we've been working at my, with my group uh, already at the University of Leiden way, way back when on development of uh, vaccines. But you know, the development of vaccines goes back much further than this. Uh, see here, Edward Jenner and Louis Pasteur, who was actually born like 100 kilometers from here on the other side of the Jura, um, who had a large influence on the development of microbiology as well as vaccines. Now, um, when it comes to more, and I have to, I'm sorry, I have to move my, uh, I have to move my floating controls here. Uh, if it comes to uh, modern development of vaccines, because many people these days said, you know, how can you develop a vaccine in so short a time, the mRNA vaccines that we've seen from um, Moderna and from uh, BioNTech. Well, you know, there's a long history behind this. Um, this is a very nice um, review by Rino Rapoli, who's one of the big guys in, in vaccinology, if you want. So these are uh, the vaccines that we have under control, right? More or less, they're available technologies or they're doable with existing technologies. Actually, uh, we're currently also involved in a small project on dengue uh, fever, which is not so, so simple as well, but with the technology we have today, it might be feasible. 
Then we have the yellow and the orange. They are doable vaccines, however, with increasing challenges for today's technology. And here you are for the pertussis. Malaria is getting better. Uh, dengue, as I already mentioned, influenza, uh, but also others like E. coli, uh, pseudomonas, and so forth. And here, of course, you have the big ones like tuberculosis. Uh, we still have only one vaccine, which is not very effective uh, against tuberculosis, and that's about it. And then we have here at the far end, the HIVs, the HPVs, and the cancer vaccines, which are now targets for which we do not yet have the scientific knowledge and or technologies. It's getting a little better for the cancer vaccines because what you also see is now the merging of cancer therapy with immunotherapy. So that's where we're getting a little better. Maybe with the current developments, we, we get there someday. Now, what are the uh, technological advances that merge to the development of a COVID-19 vaccines. And I apologize there, some um, shuffling here of my slide. But anyway, what led to this? And if you look at this, this is first of all reverse vaccinology, which sped up the process quite, uh, quite by a lot, actually uh, developed uh, among others by Rino Rapoli. So reverse vaccinology means you look at the, um, the sequence, the genetic sequence of a pathogen, and then you, have a, um, a computer program scan for possible uh, structured structures that may be antigenic in nature's nature and that could be used as a vaccine. So this has been uh, developed over the years, coming to the internet-based uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So the identification of the spike protein that we can now use as a antigen. Then second thing is looking at vaccinology from a structural uh, point of view. So looking at uh, antibody mediated antigen designs in the early 2000s, all the way up to the structure based design of COVID-19 vaccines as well, and synthetic biology, of course, which also led to or contributed to the development of, of our modern vaccines that we have today on the market that are being applied to uh, the persons to be vaccinated. And then, of course, we have a development uh, in this form, the etuans, uh, they're not that dirty anymore. Uh, before we said in vaccinology that etuans are actually the um, dirty little secrets uh, of vaccine developers. So we add something, we do not know how that works, but, you know, it, it works, it enhances the, uh, the antigenic response. Now we do have very specific um, adjuvants that interact in specific pathways to activate the immune system. Last but not least, uh, other technological advances, and here you have to mention um, big data processing and the, um, the ability to interact, to collaborate via the internet, to look at sequences, to identify these sequences, to um, then transform this into mRNA and DNA. And voila, you are in, a, um, in the development stage of a, um, of a vaccine, of an mRNA vaccine or a DNA vaccine, only two months after that. So you can go into clinical trials. And this, these experiences that we have today with the uh, Moderna, with the BioNTech and so forth, will also speed up this process because we learn every day how you do develop these vaccines. But this is actually based on this. And here you have the proteins, here you have the viral vectors, you know, for uh, AstraZeneca, that takes a little longer. And for the, uh, um, the uh, proteins, the subunit vaccines, six months, maybe eight months, so much longer than what we have here for the mRNA and DNA vaccines. But we have to say that all this is based on long, long, long years of development of mRNA technology and DNA vaccines. So what did we do talking about experience and long-term experience only over the last five years? My group with uh, our friends and, and colleagues all over the world, actually, we've been involved, we have been involved in the development of a pandemic H5N1 vaccine. I don't need to remind you that, you know, this pandemic is only one of several possible and several that may be coming in the future. So we have to be uh, prepared for this. And here, H5N1, um, the, one of the hotspots for H5N1, if whenever there would be a pandemic of this uh, virus, 
it would start in Indonesia. So what you need to do is um, enable these people to produce their vaccine on time to have a, a vaccine coverage early on, maybe to, you know, um, turn down, tune down the, the pandemic and the spreading of this disease right where it starts. Now we had another uh, development of a polyvalent uh, DNA vaccine against dengue. I just mentioned this, and this is particularly complicated because you have to use four plasmids for four antigens against the four strange of, strains of uh, dengue uh, uh, pathogens. That's a little complicated. And then last but not least, we, have, we are testing novel adjuvant and um, antigen uh, combinations in a uh, European project currently. So these were the five years only hands-on experience, and you see we had some, quite some um, um, interaction with, with our, our, our partners uh, on the other side of the road. Um, this particular project I'm going to talk about was, is actually an um, interaction between us, uh, the Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences of Western Switzerland, that's the French uh, abbreviation here, and the uh, Chulalongkorn Hospital, uh, Academic Hosp Hospital in Bangkok. So here you see um, the lady who did all the work or most of the work here, Alika Peleta, who is a student in my lab. And here you see our, our nano lab with uh, nano, the nano assembler right here. And uh, you have one very happy student here. And we have our collaborators here from the University of um, Bangkok of Chulalongkorn, uh, who approached us um, at the beginning of the lockdown, uh, which started for us in Switzerland and Geneva, particularly in the mid of March. They came to us because we were working with them before, we knew them. So they said, you know, guys, uh, our government has asked us to develop a formulation for mRNA or DNA vaccines against COVID-19. So that's when it started. Uh, we, so the, the tasks are, we do the formulations and the in vitro um, characterization and physical chemical characterization, they did the in vivo studies. So what we basically did between March and July, the whole university was on lockdown. Uh, it was only myself and Allegra in the lab. So we had access to all the different uh, equipment and resources and whatnot. So it was like working in paradise. Um, we posted this on LinkedIn, and uh, there, I think it was Martin who uh, approached us and said, you know, guys, you're working on these liposomal formulations. Can you use our equipment? And they were so kind to ship uh, their equipment over so we could test it. And the rest is history. Uh, finally, now this is actually an integral part of my lab uh, for the nano formulations. So now, um, from March to July, we did the development of different liposomal formulations for mRNA as well as DNA vaccines, which we got from Chulon and Corn. We did the physical chemical characterization, we did the tests in vitro, and then we did the tech transfer by remote control. We couldn't go to Bangkok, which we would have done, but we tried to, to do the tech for, um, like uh, by remote control, as I said. Then between August 2020 and April, we did some in vivo tests, or they did some in vivo tests in mice. Uh, with pretty good outcomes. And now, because of these encouraging results, we're waiting to go in vivo in non-human primates and probably in parallel in clinical phase one studies. And that also would need, mean that we uh, would go into GMP production. Um, however, what do you need to do in order to get there, to get um, the vaccine, the mRNA or DNA vaccine into the patient? is you need a taxi. You need some kind of formulation uh, which would help to get this big molecule, highly charged molecule into the cell. So I'm only showing here one of the challenges um, that people have when developing this. Uh, Comirnaty, so that's the uh, BioNTech Pfizer um, um, vaccine, mRNA vaccine. They are using these excipients here that you see in front of you. Um, it's true they're not liposomal formulations, they're um, solid lipid nanoparticles, if you want. Um, so what they needed to do is develop two new excipients that were never used before, according to my knowledge, never used before in the formulation, were not FDA approved, were not approved by the EMA. So they had to include these new excipients. And these excipients are actually there to stabilize the mRNA in in these particles because they are positively charged. You see here the two um, tertiary amine groups that would be then uh, protonated in the, in the lysosomes and then 
you know, would be protonated in the in the liposomes or in the uh, lipid nanoparticles and then would stabilize um, the um, the mRNA in the formulation. And the rest is cholesterol and DSPC, so nothing fancy here, some you know salt and so forth, but that's basically the formulation that you need. And going forward, I think uh, if you want to raise the storage temperature, for these uh, formulations from minus 70 currently to somewhere uh, at refrigerated temperature, I think we would need to do a little bit more on the excipient side. And that, of course, would give you some regulatory issues in the end. Um, so the formulation, um, this is actually uh, the lipid nanoparticles. We you, were using cationic uh, liposomes. Um, that's just quickly for uh, your... Uh, to, to remind you uh, how this works, but basically this mRNA-based vaccines are these nanoparticles that then would have the mRNA in there uh, associated to a lipid, as I just showed. They need to be taken up by the cell, by endocytosis, have to get out of these endosomes and lysosomes by this endosomal escape. And there, you know, the different excipients that uh, you're using may be helpful in order to uh, promote this uh, endosomal escape. Um, in contrast to what many people think, and according to fake news, these mRNA is not going into the nucleus. Forget it. There's no interaction with the nucleus at this point. For the mRNA, they go directly to the ribosomes because they are using this natural mechanism of you know, biosynthesis, protein biosynthesis. So they find their uh, ribosomes here, and then you have the protein expression. In this case, the spike protein, which is then presented by MHC class two, class one uh, proteins on the surface of these um, cells. Then you, there are your immune cells, your T cells, which are then activated by this interaction here. Now, the advantages is that they trigger both a humoral and cellular immune response. So both T cells and antibodies are being uh, produced. There's no risk of infection because the only thing that you transmit to the vaccinee is the genetic information of a certain protein. Uh, and they're easier to transfect because they do not have to cross a second barrier, so the nuclear membrane here, in order to get into the nucleus. Disadvantages, poor stability, minus 70 degrees, and relatively low immunogenicity. So the immune system really needs to be a little activated in order to see that. So the second one is the pure DNA vaccine. So they're a little more complicated because here the DNA has to get into the nucleus in order to you know, have this paradigm of biosynthesis or protein biosynthesis translation, transduction to the right, uh, translation to mRNA and then uh, transduction to mRNA and translation into proteins, which then are also being uh, presented. Advantages here are the stability, and we experienced that when we tried to send our formulations, the mRNA formulations, to Bangkok. They were gone. They were dead. We couldn't do it. Uh, whereas the DNA uh, vaccines, they worked well. We could uh, actually send them on ice uh, to, to Bangkok. Um, no risk of infection, again, because all you transmit is just the genetic information for um, the, um, the antigenic protein. And again, uh, all the immune system is activated. The disadvantages, again, are low transfection and relatively low immunogenicity. There's a long story about pDNA-based vaccines that are really nicely working in animals, not so nice afterwards in, in humans. But today we have different carriers, as you, as you know, that might be helpful in this case. Now, what we did is we had liposomal formulations for the two projects. This is our, um, our virus here with the spike proteins expressed on the surface. So we took, we got the pDNA expressing for the S protein, but also for two subunits, which we also tested. And we got the mRNA for the, for the S, for the whole spike protein and the S1 um, subunit, which we also did some studies on. And uh, in, we use some GFP uh, mRNA as a as a model, just as a um, as a messenger RNA, in order to show transfection efficiency. What I will talk about today about the pDNA and the S uh, protein, which we then formulated into into liposomal formulations. That's the project. We used the pDNA. We used cationic liposomes. Um, 
so we had uh, a certain, so we integrated the uh, DNA information for the S protein into a certain vector there, which you can see there. Uh, we injected that into mice. Um, so the, we had the protein expression of the spike protein, adaptive immune response activation. And then in the end, we looked at neutralizing antibody production, total IgG, IgG subtypes, and so forth. And, as, and again, this was done. So the characterization here in the formulation part was done at our lab, and the rest was, was done at uh, Chulalong Kron. We had also controls. One was the naked DNA uh, plasmid that we injected also intramuscularly. Um, maybe you know I've been talking about etchevans, but you know on these plasmid vectors, which are bacterial in nature, you have the CPG sequences, which do interact with certain uh, toll-like receptors, so uh, receptors of the innate immune system. So basically, the pDNA may act as its own etchevan to some extent. So this was our uh, negative control or the baseline control, if you want. And our partners in uh, Chulalong Korn also had some um, experience with electroporation, where you use electric current in order to get the plasmid and or the uh, mRNA into the patient through the skin. And this was then our, say, our, our benchmark uh, to compare our technology with the, uh, with the liposomes with. Why we're doing this, um, Thailand is a low or medium income country. So electroporation uh, affords some very heavy equipment, uh, needs to, people need to be trained and so forth. Might be really expensive to do that. So they wanted another solution, uh, which could be gen, uh, just injected and that's it. And that's what we provided with this project. So first of all, when you go about this, and we're here in a uh, tea time seminar webinar of precision nanosystems, and you know their technology is microfluidics. Now, what we do, at least in our lab, um, is uh, we do a pre-formulation of our liposomal um, formulations. Um, and we're using either ethanol injection, which is quite transferable afterwards to, um, to the um, microfluidics method, uh, or we use this um, thin film layer hydration, rehydration method. So it's a classical method where you have the organic solvents with the phospholipids that then are forming liposomes. You, um, you know, put a vacuum here, so you evaporate the solvents, you have a formation of these phospholipids as a film, then you rehydrate this with a certain buffer, and you have this heterogeneous liposome uh, suspension, which after sonification gives you some more uh, homogeneous liposome suspension. And of course, then we added the RNA or the pDNA on the surface of these uh, of these liposomes. So basically, we use these liposomes as carriers for both DNA and RNA. And here we use the DPPC dope dotab at a certain, um, I'm sorry, these uh, different um, phospholipids at different uh, ratios. So the specialists among you that already have done some liposomal work would say, "Yeah, pff, what's new? I mean, this is uh, rather stuff that you use." typically for liposomes. What we needed to have, um, when we discussed this with our um, colleagues in Thailand, we needed to have something where we didn't infringe on any patents, where we had freedom to operate, where we could say, we can take this from our shelf, we mix it together, and nobody can stop us from using this afterwards as, um, as uh, vaccines in, in this setting. So what we did, uh, this was one of the things, um, of the factors that influenced us with our, our um, recipe there, our formulation we had there. The second one was the translation from the film method, or we also used um, ethanol injection method, to microfluidics. We wanted something that was easily transferable to there. Why microfluidics? Because we wanted to do, if that was successful, a scale-up. Um, we have the medium sized equipment in our lab and we can directly scale this up to the bigger machines where we can um, also produce GMP material. And there are um, 
equipment uh, available in Asia where this can be done. So we thought, okay, we do this now here in the microfluidics with a relatively easy formulation straightforward. We can scale this up easier afterwards. And then we wanted to do this tech transfer to low medium income country uh, and it needed to be cheap and no infringement on patents. And we made sure uh, that we had FTO by a patent search we did with a very nice officer there at the Bern Patent Office, which was the workplace of Einstein uh, at his time then. So scaling up tech transfer from Switzerland to Thailand and freedom to operate and ease of trans tech transfer. These were the factors that were influencing our work and this always influencing when you work um, with groups from low to medium income countries. We actually had a um, recent publications, publication on this, this topic. So now the first thing we did, we looked at blank liposomes. And here you see, we tested different uh, ratios here between DPPC, DOPE, and DOTAP. We measured the Z average in our um, zeta sizer, and we looked at the PDI, which was, was okay. So for this one, we were in a 100 nanometer scale at uh, PDI that was, is acceptable, 0 0.15, 18 or so. We also measured the zeta potential, so um, the charge, the, the surface charge, and we were here in a positive value which we needed in order to, you know, coat the DNA afterwards and have stable complexes. And this is just a TEM we made um, from these uh, liposomes. Actually, during the pandemic, they opened up the electromicroscopy department and they made this for us. They, they actually started their microscopes only for us, and I am very thankful for them. Then we did uh, what you do, uh, test your uh, toxicity. There might be some toxicity involved, but you know, we didn't see anything. That's the mitochondrial uh, activity, which is actually an indication of the proliferation of these cells. These are macrophage uh, cell line. And you see there's not much difference here. Yeah? So all the liposomes had a size of 100, 150 nanometers, positive zeta potential, and they did not show acute toxicity on macrophages. Nice. Then we complex with the pDNA, and that's when things got started to be a little different because uh, we got some rather large aggregates partially. Uh, PDI went up uh, quite, uh, for instance, for this uh, to totally heterogenic. So we had some optimization to do here. But however, we did also uh, the zeta potential measurements where these were the blank liposomes. And of course, when you added the DNA, then went down according to the ratios we applied here. And then at a certain point, it turned back to, to positive again. But we wanted something here in this range. So we, what we choose was the 0 0.25 to 1 and 1 1.1 ratio that was so ch chosen as a size and PDI were acceptable for us, as you can see here from this little graph. Now, this was all in film method. Then we switched to continuous manufacturing to microfluidics. And a good friend of mine at the University, Technical University of Graz recently um, presented this, that we need this continuous manufacturing for these novel, um, novel drugs, these nanomedicines, these non-biological complex drugs, which these vaccines are actually are. So, um, this uh, microfluidics method is actually used, as far as I know, by both BioNTech as well as Moderna here in, in uh, the canton of Wallis here in Switzerland to produce their, their, their uh, vaccines. So what we did, um, you may be familiar with this, uh, you have these different channels where you can enter uh, different fluids like ethanol and lipids, water, maybe together with your RNA or together with, with other uh, APIs. And then uh, it mixes together according to a, a certain technology that was developed by, um, by the company. And then you come out with these nice liposome, liposomes that are forming here in the end. And then by adjusting different parameters in this process here, uh, you can adjust for particle size, you can adjust for different uh, um, factors, uh, properties of these, these particles by <clears throat> changing, for instance, the flow or the, the speed of the flow going through this or the speed of mixing here. You can adjust this and then you come up with different um, sizes and quite consistently afterwards, as we found out. Now we 
adapted the protocol to our microfluidic device that we had here. And I'm using here an old uh, image of an older model, but we have the newer one. Um, this is basically it. You're using a cartridge uh, that you obtain from uh, precision and assistance. And then, then you can make your, your liposomes in one go in a very quick, um, very quick um, process and protocol once the protocol is established. The main parameters to optimize the flow rate ratio and the total flow rate. That's how you can play with this, maybe also with the concentration of your, of your stuff. So here I put down a couple of uh, advantages and to my, or our opinion, little something that probably can be optimized still. So it's, uh, we have controlled physical chemical properties. We could, you know, repetitively, um, have a certain size of these uh, these particles, so it's very reproducible, uh, easy scale up, as I said, from the medium to the, the bigger um, equipment, time saving, I mean, it goes like this very quickly. Um, there are non-turbulent process conditions, reduction of human error, because it's uh, you know, standardized, whereas the, the ethanol injection we do in our lab, or also the film method is um, depending on the operator. So this is totally, um, independent of this. However, we are uh, also in Switzerland, we are an academic lab and these cartridges are not very um, cheap and you can only use them once. Um, so this is a, a setback for us. So we really have to do the pre-formulation before we go into this machine to be sure what we're doing, not to, to have to use too many of these cartridges in the end. And then the a problem that occurred that we also uh, posed the question to, to, I think, to Martin is the sterility. Because what we need also for our vaccines, uh, we need a sterile product in the end. We're testing this in, in mice, because otherwise we would have some effects that would be due to non sterility, and that's something we don't want. But we found that by uh, optimizing our process under a sterile environment, at least, we uh, had clean uh, samples that we then sent over to, to Bangkok. We, we tested for that. So now we did the optimization. Here you see the zone microfluidics. Uh, there are the different flow rates we used for the different uh, ratios and so forth. And you see uh, the PDI came down quite significantly to below 0 0.2. So we were quite happy with this. And the size was also like under the 100 nanometer range. We could, you know, uh, we tested the stability here. This is shown for 20 days and 30 days stability. And we always saw the same um, size or comparable size, a little bit higher maybe, but uh, in the same range of ballpark of uh, after storage for 30 days or 20 days. And then um, what we do, we produce these uh, by microfluidics and then the it's a rather big volume in the end. So we try to, uh, remove the solvent by tangential flow filtration. We have a little lab um, um, equipment there, but you can also uh, transfer this, uh, scale this up to bigger processes as they do in the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, then we did the complexation sizes. So we compared the rehydration with the, versus the microfluidics. Here you see the thin film hydration. Here you see the microfluidics. So you see, this is quite comparable in the sizes. However, the, uh, the microfluidics were uh, more consistent, uh, more or less. And also what, uh, when you look at the zeta potential here, you basically have the same results more or less in the end for the different uh, NP ratios that we were using. We looked at complex stability for the long term of our liposomes uh, at four degrees Celsius after microfluidics uh, procedure. And we have now in 114 days, um, here you see the zeta potential, which is uh, went up a little bit uh, to 50 after the first week, but then stayed more or less stable over the whole time. And plus we had the, um, the sizes, which also went up by a little, but not very significantly. And they stayed more or less uh, at the 160, 170 nanometer range, uh, as you see here. So that's not bad. So the PDI was at 0 0.15. That's acceptable for these liposomes, in my opinion. Um, and we looked at complex stability, the rehydration versus microfluidics, thin film rehydration. So we put this into a gel and we looked whether the uh, DNA would escape from this complexation. This was 
really stable and quite comparable between the two. However, what we saw for uh, in electron microscopy for the thin film hydration, we, we think this was monolemular, whereas for microfluidics, we saw one or two of these maybe multilemular uh, liposomes, but we still have to clarify whether this was really the case, but consistent again. Um, then we looked at uh, electrophoric mobility and the stability in nuclease containing mediums. So we exposed our uh, DNA to a nuclease, that, an enzyme that normally degrades DNA. And there again, in complete MEM, so that's uh, the incubation medium after 15 minutes incubation at room temperature, and incomplete MEM after 24 hours in 37 degrees Celsius. And we saw partial degradation of 15 minutes and total aggregation of the PDNAS after 24 hours incubation, which is not surprising, but the liposomes managed to protect DNA in the biological medium after 24 hours of incubation. So that was not too bad, as you see here uh, in 37 degrees, you see here, this was uh, protected after 24 hours in 37 degrees, not too bad. Then we did the transfection uh, uh, in HEC-293 uh, cells, just to show that our PDNA is still working. Don't have to go into all, to the, to all the details, just mentioning that we got the primary anti-S antibody, actually two of them from our local um, antibody platform. So that was the University of Geneva who developed these NTS antibodies that we could then use as a primary antibody and secondary antibody was an FITC antibody. And we did some hook staining and we did confocal uh, microscopy on them. So that's what we got in HEC 293 cells, cells alone, there was nothing, that's hook staining for the nuclei. Then we did uh, the DOTA PDNAS uh, 0. To five to one and one to one. And here you see quite some of uh, these points here appearing, the fluorescence, I don't know whether you can see them. This, these are actually, um, you know, uh, uh, expression of the S protein. And here you see in a somewhat bigger um, magnification, uh, the one to one ratio, and you see quite some fluorescence here coming out of these cells. We also used, in this case, lipofectamine, which is a very good transfection agent with the DNA, and we saw approximately comparable, maybe a little less expression uh, in these um, lipofectamine uh, positive control cells. So then we went to, after these uh, encouraging um, results, we went in vivo and we used a dose of 100 microgram of PDNA as formulated with DOTAP at two different ratios, 0.5 to five and one to one. It was like the first uh, application was here, then after two weeks and after three weeks, after four weeks, I'm sorry, we had uh, the second and the third uh, uh, boost of uh, application of the tDNA. And then after eight weeks, uh, we euthanized the, uh, the mice and we isolated the spleens. We also did some um, um, washings of the lungs to go for IgAs. We also looked at blood samples for IgGs. Now, um, these are the IgG, the total titers and the subtypes we obtained. So in the week two, after the first uh, application, there's basically your, your basic, uh, basic level, you see that there's Ig endpoint titers is like 100, there's not much in there. However, if we give after week four, so the, the first boost, Oh, the second boost, I'm sorry, that was um, a little higher. So uh, the naked uh, DNA didn't give much uh, of an improvement compared to the week two. However, for the, old, the three other groups, so the one-to-one, -one, the 0 0.25 to one, and the electroporation gave significantly higher endpoint titers of total IgG. We're looking now at IgG1 and IgG2A. We saw approximately comparable titers for um, these uh, different uh, groups here. Now we did the virus neutralization assay. Uh, if you know how um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus infects cells, it's doing that by the interaction of the spike protein with the ACE2 receptor. Now what we did, we used an ELISA plate, uh, coated the ACE2 receptor onto this ELISA plate, and then um, what usually happens when we uh, edit a, um, a TMB and um, 
hydroxyperoxide, you would get a signal, which is this HRP conjugated RBD. Now, if you have neutralizing antibodies against the spike protein, um, the neutralizing antibodies would interfere with this interaction here. So you would not have this signal here, and you would have uh, an inhibition, as I said, with the ACE2 receptor. That's what we did. We looked at the virus neutralization assay, receptor binding inhibition assay. In this case, we used the serum from these mice. I incubated that in the way I just uh, mentioned. This is the uh, virus neutralization assay here, and you see we got quite an increase of inhibition or an inhibition up to 60-70% of uh, virus binding. And we got neutralization antibodies. Um, it's a logarithmic scale here, of course, where you see that, yes, we get some improvement with the naked plasmids if you want. However, we get higher titers here for neutralizing antibodies for the two DNA um, plasmids, as well as for electroporation. And basically, there was no difference between the gold standard, which is the electroporation, against our DNA vaccines. We looked at T cell responses as well, and there the electroporation was higher than uh, for the two DNA vaccines. However, the two DNA vaccines were higher than for the uh, IM for the naked plasmid in this case as well. Then we looked at um, different, again, HEC293 uh, cells at the protein expression. So nothing was, uh, we went back uh, again. So nothing was expressed here in the control group. Lipofectamine, we had quite some expression as we had for the two um, liposomal uh, formulations uh, that were prepared by microfluidics. And then we uh, compared the NP ratio one to one by done by microfluidics to the NP ratio one to one by thin film hydration and the lipofectamine, the control and the negative control here. And you see that, yes, by microfluidics, we get about the same results as we get for rehydration. So it looks like we have a good method and a reproducible method to be working with. So in conclusions from this uh, account was, yes, we were able to produce stable liposomes uh, and the um, stability studies that are going on. PDNA liposomes, we could characterize and we selected certain NP ratios or charge ratios that uh, gave us quite nice results in terms of protein expression in HEC 293 cells in, in vitro, which was confirmed by confocal microscopy. We had neutralizing antibodies after this uh, in vivo studies uh, in the specific mice, and we have a manufacturing method for microfluidics that was optimized in order to obtain um, the homogeneity in our liposomal uh, formulations. And that can now be transferred to another lab, of course. So the perspectives are we need to quantify the gene expression. We are trying to do this by PCR. This is work in progress in order not to only have the expression by confocal microscopy and fluorescence, but also to quantify this on the genetic level uh, as well, and maybe also on a protein level by ELISAs. We have to repeat, or we are currently repeating the immunization studies that come to an end like next week. And then we have the second or third even confirmation that this works. And after results confirmation, we test on the mice uh, for the same immunization protocol as for rehydration method liposomes. Actually, that's something that was going on. It's an old slide that's going on currently. And we're having good results as well for um, the microfluidics uh, formulation method for the in vivo studies. So with this, I'd like to thank our collaborators, this is Chula Long Khan. I'd like to uh, thank my collaborators in Geneva, the antibody and imaging platforms, which we uh, made use of quite in intensively. And I'd like to give a special thanks to Martin and, and Jürgen for helping us out during this uh, pandemic situation and be, ve be very responsive and um, you know, teaching us and training us uh, by remote control actually now. And I would like to thank you for your attention. I'd like to thank you for all these insights, for your presentation, for your time. Um, and yeah, for stepping up in your, in your vacation to do this for us. And yeah, to the audience, thanks for, for staying uh, over time. Thanks for being here today. And see you next time. Thank you.